shine bright like a diamond. Those are the last words 15-year-old Leah Anderson posted on Facebook. She wrote it just a few hours before she disappeared. Every day I see her walking out that door because that's the last time I've seen her alive. Two years ago, she walked out her front door and became one of the nearly 1,200 missing or murdered Indigenous women in Canada. And like so many others, her murder remains unsolved and her story untold. We made the journey to God's Lake Narrows, a Cree community in northern Manitoba, home to 1,400 people. It's a fly-in community, accessible only by plane and by an ice road for part of the winter. There have been a few other murders in God's Lake Narrows, but Leah's is the only one still unsolved. Her family believes her killer is still here in the community. Leah's younger sister, Angel, always has her guard up. But there's like, just some people have to watch out for. Not watch out for, but like, suspects that I heard of. And when I see them, I kind of just like, like watch them, see how they react when they see me, because they must know that I'm her sister. What was it like living in God's Lake Narrows before Leah died? It was different. It wasn't so lonely and so scary now. After living in 13 different foster homes, Leah's older sister Tiffany used to think of God's Lake Narrows as a safe haven, but not anymore. Are you afraid? Like I said, I can't trust it no more. Even just even if it's just a little little walk by myself, I won't go alone. Not at nighttime either. The night she disappeared, Leah went out walking by herself. When she didn't come home, her family thought she stayed with a friend. But by the second night, they were worried. And on Sunday morning, they heard on the radio that a body was found. First, when we were at the station, a cop came and showed us a hat and we were looking at it, but it wasn't hers. So we just felt like a little bit relieved. But then he came out with a picture of a boot in the snow and he showed us. And I was beside my sister, my auntie, my uncle. And right when we saw that picture, we knew it was hers. <laughs> We just started crying right away. <laughs> when her body was found near the snowmobile trail, they originally believed Leah had been mauled to death by dogs. But then her family learned the truth. She was brutally beaten and murdered. Her Aunt Myra says it's been hard to live in the community since Leah's death. It's like on my mind every day, like who could, could have done this? Do I see this person? Is he around here? Is there a suspect? Do they have a suspect at all? Even harder because many believed this should have been an open and shut case. The weekend Leah was killed, the only road in or out of the community was closed. When the RCMP arrived to investigate her death, her killer or killers were likely still here. Leah's family says the RCMP investigators stayed in the community for a few days after her body was found, but have only been back sporadically since. I just don't understand, like, how come they're not here? I always say that, how come they're not here to do the investigation? They tell me that they questioned a lot of people, but I don't think they questioned, like, all of the people they say they did. The glare of a small community makes it difficult to hide. It's not like a big city where it's easy to slip into the shadows. Everyone here knows everyone else. But yet there were no arrests in the days after her death or in the years since. I think about her every day. 
I don't show it. I don't tell anyone. I don't talk to nobody sometimes. I just don't know how to, you know, I don't know how to talk about it no more. Leah's death wasn't the first time violence wreaked havoc on their family. Their father, Gilbert, was murdered when Leah was six. Their mother, Sally, struggled to cope, and all four Anderson kids ended up in foster care. But then their aunt Myra and Uncle Wayne brought them to live here in God's Lake Narrows. I try so hard to be the strong for these kids. Where is that justice for her? We need justice for her. It scares me that this person might do it again. There's not a lot to do in God's Lake Narrows at night. The only place open is the arena. And when Leah left home that Friday night, she told her family she was coming here. But the friend she was supposed to meet said she waited and waited, but Leah never came. The rumor mill is rampant in any small community, but an unsolved murder just adds fuel to the fire. And it wasn't long before we started hearing the rumors too. They're saying that they were partying at her place and they're saying they saw Leah there. They said that she was there at the arena that night. She was she at her early. sister's at a party. They're saying they saw Leah there. The four women saw him say that he murdered someone. Well, this girl went to go burn her mattress. I heard one of the girls said, let's go find Leah. Yeah. I guess they went for that walk. I was surprised at how many people in God's Lake Narrows were not only willing, but eager to talk to us, as though they'd been waiting for someone to come and hear their stories. But still, the details of Leah's last hours remained shrouded in mystery. God's Lake Narrows is a dry community, which means no alcohol allowed, but parties still happen in secret or underground. Several people told us they heard the night Leah went missing, she went to a party at this house. The next day, we went to talk to the woman who hosted the party. Is uh, Josephine here? Yeah, she's here. Can I talk to her? Yeah. We heard that there was a, a party at your place that night. Was Leah there? No. No? No. I didn't even know who she was. Yeah. She, I heard she was just a little girl. Would Stephen talk to us? Did Josephine's brother, Stephen Chubb, was also someone we wanted to talk to. We had heard that he and Leah had dated in the months before she died. He doesn't want to. Okay. So. We spent the next day or two knocking on doors and chasing down as many rumors as we could, trying to find out if anyone had seen Leah that night. We're doing a story about Leah. Can we interview you? And each door we knocked on was a window into a community pushed to extremes. They live in isolation, but the houses are often overcrowded. The daily struggle for basic services is evident every time you turn on the radio. Water truck, Joseph truck out of water. We got a request for sewage truck. We heard many stories of abuse and addiction. The legacies of residential school are evident here. Despite its beauty, this is not an easy place to live. On our last day in God's Lake Narrows, we heard about two women troubled by something shocking they'd heard. We were at my friend's place. Um, we were drinking together, and he just said, said that out of nowhere, and like I already murdered somebody. What did you say? Don't, didn't, I pretended to laugh, and I looked at him, and I said, who did you murder? And he told me, you don't have to worry about it. Destiny Anderson was also there that night. But all he all said was, I committed murder. I'm going away for a long time, and I'm going to hell. They said it was Stephen Chubb, the man we had heard dated Leah before her death. And although he refused our earlier requests, this time he agreed to talk to us. We heard today that you said at a party when you were drunk that you had murdered somebody and that you were going to hell. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I said. Is uh, it true? No. I was just fucking around. 
Thanos guys looked at me. They just went inside and I said, hey, I'm just kidding. But they, they looked all scared. You said you killed somebody? Yeah. Just the sound, I don't know. That's stupid, I don't feel like, I don't know. It's hard to say because it's stupid. Steven said he and Leah had a secret relationship that ended months before she died. But he admits to sending her a Facebook message the morning after she disappeared, which cast a shadow of suspicion on him. Why do you think they're blaming you? Because um, cause I messaged her. I said, I told her, I hope you didn't tell on this. I said, I messaged her that and it was seen by uh, one of her family members. Right on Saturday morning, I messaged her. Why did you do that? I said? Why did you message her? Oh, because um, I didn't want her to tell nobody, her family. How come? About us. I don't know. I just didn't want to. Stephen, were you involved with Leah's death? No. No. Stephen says RCMP have brought him in twice for questioning and that he passed a lie detector test. Last summer, 18 months after her death, RCMP investigators returned to God's Lake and took DNA samples from people in the community, including Stephen, something he says he hopes will clear his name. I talked to a main investigator, but you know, he seems to be telling me the same thing each time I talk to him. We are working on it. I assure you, we are working on it. Like, like two years. Two years is too long. We spoke to the RCMP, but all they could say is their investigation into Leah's murder is ongoing. But it seems the trail has gone cold, and her family is losing hope that they will ever find her killer. It kind of disgusts me in my heart that someone would do something like that and then just live like they did nothing wrong. But they did something wrong. They took my sister. Sorry, it's hard. As tragic as Leah's story is, the hard truth is she is one of many. Over 225 unsolved cases of missing or murdered Indigenous women. Families left wondering. Communities left in limbo and killers left to roam free. Connie Walker, CBC News, God's Lake Narrows, First Nation, Manitoba.